and um, just uh, thank you for your grace, your love, your mercy. Thank you for Jesus. And we're here to worship you this morning. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. Even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, Troubles run until that day comes. 
you, Lord, that you deliver us. Thank you that you're our hiding place who can take us from your hand. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.
saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart. Thank you, Jesus. What a promise. So many promises in that song, Lord. We cling to them. We cling to the hope that is in you, that's in your word. Thank you, Lord. Our chains are gone. Thank you for forgiveness, for your grace, for your mercy that you just cover us with like a flood. Thank you, Jesus. We can't say it enough. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Matt, if you want to come forward, we'll receive this morning's tithes and offerings. And Father, again, we thank you. And we love you, Lord. And thank you for providing for us and 
watching over us, Lord, and, and um, God, we just give a portion of what you've given us back to you, Lord, and, and pray that you uh, would do the fish and loaves thing and, um, and multiply it, Lord, for your kingdom, for your glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And after the basket comes by, you can uh, stand up and um, stretch out a little bit and greet each other if you'd like. Let's uh, take our seats and open to the Gospel of Matthew, if you have your Bibles. And uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your word today, Lord, and uh, pray that you bless it to our hearts, our minds, and um, God, that you would just reveal Jesus to us more and more each day as we um, draw near to you, Lord, draw near to us. Thank you. Bless our time in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're continuing in our study in the Gospel of Matthew, A Radical Life, and just moving along. And uh, last week's message was overcoming temptation. And uh, there it is. Overcoming temptation by being led by the Spirit, by being fed by the Word, and be, by being dead to the world. And today's message is light has dawned as we studied verses, study verses 12 through uh, 17. And uh, if you missed uh, last week's um, sermon by Luke, uh, I'd encourage you to go on YouTube and um, take a look. It was really, uh, really good. And uh, so I um, uh, was happy to have uh, Luke join us here uh, virtually <laughs> last week. And uh, so that was pretty cool. And thank the Lord we didn't have any technical problems. <laughs> so uh, that was major. So at this point in time in our story, uh, Jesus has been baptized by John the Baptist. The Father from heaven spoke and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of a, a dove. Right. And in that we saw the Trinity. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is a biblical concept that's taught throughout the Scriptures, both Old and New Testaments. And we naturally see them as three separate persons independent from each other. However, that's not true. You need to understand they are, in fact, three revelations of the same God. Three revelations of the one God. And in the original Greek language, the original Koine Greek, which is different than modern Greek, but it's an ancient Greek language. That's what the New Testament was written in. The grammar is the truth equals the word equals the spirit. In other words, they are absolutely equivalent in every aspect. They equal each other. But that's not all. According to the same Greek grammar, the Father equals Jesus Christ equals the Holy Spirit. And it's a difficult concept for us, uh, for our finite minds, but although there are three distinct persons, they are also one in the same and equivalent in every aspect. And that's built right into the ancient Greek grammar. You say, I don't understand, Mike. Well, even the disciples didn't understand. They didn't get it. For example, in John 14, 8, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it's sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and you have not seen me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? So you see what he's saying there, folks? The Father equals Jesus Christ equals the Holy Spirit. They are equivalent in every aspect. And so Jesus was baptized and the triune God validated it. And then Jesus was led in the Spirit led by the, by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And Jesus was victorious. 
And I'm going to say that again. <laughs> Jesus was victorious. We look at the temptation and we think, oh, man, Jesus had to be tempted by the devil. Forget that. Jesus was victorious, folks. In other words, what we couldn't do, what we can't do in the flesh, Jesus did in the flesh. Are you with me? He was sinless. So what we can't do in the flesh, we overcome temptation at times, but we also cave into it at times. What we can't do in the flesh, Jesus did in the flesh. He takes care of it for us. So that's what our belief in Christ does for us. It cleanses us. It washes us clean because he did it. He was victorious. So we pick up the story there. Matthew 4, verse 12. Now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. Verse 16, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. And from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So light is dawned. Number one in your outlines, Jesus is the light. Jesus is the light. Now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. So notice John the Baptist's imprisonment appears to have prompted Jesus to go back up to Galilee, which was his home area, right? His home area was Nazareth up there in Galilee. He lived in Nazareth but came down to Judea in order to be baptized by John. So that's what he was doing down there. And according to John's gospel, he stayed in Judea for a little while and had an, a very early Judean ministry before his Galilean ministry. So it could be that both Jesus and John the Baptist were both preaching in Judea for a short time before John was put in prison. And then when, once John was put in prison, things started heating up. Jesus went back up to Galilee. And the word Galilee comes from a root word, which means, uh, uh, literally it means um, roll, to roll, or a circle, or a circuit. So that's what the word means, and it's speaking of a circuit, a circle of about 20 cities. And so it was called Galilee, the circle of cities. In fact, by, it was called by Isaiah, the circuit of the Gentiles, or the circle of the Gentiles. And according to the Jewish historian Josephus, there were about 200 total cities in this whole area with a population of about 3 million people. That's Josephus, the Jewish historian. And uh, this was a very populated area, and over half of that population had become Gentile. So remember, this was the area that was settled by the 12 tribes, uh, but eventually it became uh, gentilized, if you will. So Jesus, the light, is moving to Gentile territory to be the light to the Gentiles. And what a metaphor uh, for Jesus, that is, to be the light. To be the light. Uh, light, it brings the idea of illumination, uh, of uh, understanding of, of knowledge. It, br it brings the idea of exposure of sin, of exposure of darkness. Uh, it brings the idea of radiance, of holiness, you know. Jesus said, I am, one of his famous I am statements, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. He is the light. And so verse 13. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali. And so he leaves Nazareth and goes and dwells in Capernaum. And, uh, but that's all Matthew tells us about that. 
And in Luke's gospel, it tells us why Jesus left Nazareth. So it gives us insight into why he actually left there and went to Capernaum. And this is important. Let's take a look. Luke 4, verse 16. So he came to Nazareth. That is from Judea. He came up to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Now, this passage in Isaiah is a messianic prophecy. It refers to the coming Messiah. So he reads it, verse 18. We'll take that again. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, notice the capital letter, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then, verse 20, he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. You could hear a pin drop. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Do you realize what he's saying there? He's saying, I am the Messiah. I am the Son of God. So, it goes down to verse 28. So, all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. And rose up and thrust him, where? Out of the city. What city? Nazareth, right. And they led him to the brow of the hill in which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. And then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. Then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. So there, Luke gives us the reason that he left Nazareth and went down to Capernaum. And so, uh, Capernaum, he was not accepted in his own country. So he goes to, Caper to Capernaum, which is on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, about 20 miles as the crow flies from Nazareth, but about a 30 to 40 mile walk. And so, and this is about 78 miles north of Jerusalem, just to give you a perspective of the whole thing. And as you can see, the uh, Sea of Galilee is a harp shaped uh, lake. It looks like a harp. Here's an image from NASA, from space, of the whole region. And you can see the Sea, the sea of Galilee. The Jordan feeds into the sea and then out of the sea. And you can see the Jordan Valley there, the, the fertility of it. You know, it's all green and all uh, because of that uh, Jordan uh, River. The Sea of Galilee is the lowest freshwater lake on the face of the earth. It is the lowest freshwater lake and the second lowest lake in the world after the Dead Sea. And so looking at a cross-section of the whole thing, you can see the Mediterranean Sea there on the left, sea level. And then you can see on the right the depression there. The blue line is the Sea of Galilee below sea level. And then the Dead Sea you can see is uh, down below that. The Dead Sea is 1,355 feet below sea level. <laughs> and the Sea of Galilee is 705 feet below sea level. And so these are the two, two lowest lakes on earth. Pretty interesting. And looking at the topography of this, uh, you can see how depressed the lake is to the surrounding uh, mountains and the land area and all. A little blurry, but... Uh, kind of gives you the perspective and the idea of the Mediterranean Sea there uh, in the upper left uh, background. The Sea of Galilee's main source of water is the Jordan River. And it feeds into there from the mountains. And also another source for the Sea of Galilee is underground springs as well. This lake, the Sea of Galilee, is about 13 miles long and about 8 miles wide. And why am I getting into all of this? 
Well, Matthew, we're going to spend a lot of time here <laughs> in the Gospel of Matthew around this uh, Sea of Galilee. And uh, because this is the area where Jesus had most of his ministry. So I think it's important to famili familiarize ourselves with it as much as possible where it feels like we're there with him. Especially when we get to chapter 5 and the Beatitudes because this is where the Sermon on the Mount took place. On the Mount of Beatitudes. And uh, so uh, going to Capernaum, the ruins of Capernaum are still there to, it, to this day, but it's ruins, nothing but ruins. It was a small uh, fishing village about two miles west of the Jordan River. Uh, and um, uh, there's another uh, view of it. The name Capernaum means the village of Nahum. The village of Nahum. And Matthew refers later to Capernaum as the Lord's city. The Lord's own city. It was Jesus' headquarters for his Galilean ministry. And in fact, he did ministry from Capernaum for about two years of his three-year ministry. Jesus performed more miracles and, pre and preached more sermons around this town than anywhere else. The Sermon on the Mount took place here. His transfiguration took place here. He taught 19 of his 32 parables here. And 25 of his 33 recorded miracles occurred in Galilee. Now, Capernaum sat on the international highway from Babylon to Egypt called the Via Maris, which means the way of the sea. And this is one of the reasons news about Jesus spread throughout the land so rapidly. And so Capernaum controlled the trade route uh, in that area uh, along this uh, Via Maris. And this, combined with its fishing industry and manufacturing, made it a rich city at the time of Jesus. So this was not just a you know, small uh, ghost town kind of a thing, uh, but it was a flourishing, rich uh, city. Around 200 BC, there was hardly anyone living there. But by the time of Jesus, Capernaum was a, a thriving city. And Josephus tells us that many of the towns of that area had populations of 15,000 or more. Remember, total population of 3 million in the Galilee region. And that could explain the very large crowds that followed Jesus in that area. Also, uh, this is why Peter the fisherman lived here in Capernaum, along with his brother Andrew. This town was buzzing. And beneath the foundations of this Byzantine church at Capernaum, archaeologists made one of the most exciting biblical discoveries, a simple first century A.D. home that may have been the house of Peter, they believe, and also the home of Jesus while he was headquartered there. This is also why this city, because it was rich, needed a tax collector booth, which is where Matthew was stationed. He was also from here, you see. So Matthew also lived in Capernaum. And this may have been uh, something of what it looked like back in the day. So looking back at verse 13 again. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali. And so on his way from Nazareth over to Capernaum, Jesus would have traveled through Cana again. According to John's gospel, Jesus and his family earlier had attended a wedding feast there, remember. And it is there that he performed his first miracle of changing water into uh, wine. And so Jesus' trek to Capernaum uh, would have taken a little while. It was a 30 to 40 mile walk, as I said. And he probably preached along the way and stopped uh, to see people and what have you as he uh, went along. Uh, because the wedding, the, the, uh, wedding at Cana, it's believed by m many scholars that it was a family relative of Jesus's that they went to that wedding for. And here's one more look, and this is looking from the north 
to the south, and you could see Judea and Jerusalem in the background there, uh, just to, uh, again to give you another perspective of it. So Jesus is the light, number two, the people sat in darkness. Verse 14, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulun and uh, the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and the shadow of death, light has dawned. For light to dawn, there has to be darkness. For light to dawn, there has to be darkness. So Matthew's quoting Isaiah here, who had prophesied that the light would come to this region. And Matthew saw this as the fulfillment of prophecy. And it certainly is true. Jesus is the light of the world. But Jesus says, you are the light of the world as well. So not only is Jesus the light of the world, but you are the light of the world. And for our light to dawn and to shine, folks, we have to be surrounded by darkness, which we are. This ties into what Luke was teaching last Sunday. Folks, if the, if the world wasn't dark, it wouldn't need our light. If the world wasn't dark, it wouldn't need our light. Here's a quote for you. Whenever you see darkness, there is extraordinary opportunity for the light to burn brighter. By that great theologian, Bono. <laughs> but he's right. He's right. And um, I know it's easy to get frustrated with the darkness that's around us and to isolate ourselves from it. But the reality is the darkness is the opportunity for light. And so, listen, darkness can't drive out darkness. It takes light to do that. Hatred can't drive out hatred. It takes love to do that. So just throwing more hatred onto the pot is not going to do anything. It takes love to drive out the hatred. Many Christians isolate themselves and they'll only deal with other Christians because they're offended by the dark. And they'll only deal with Christian companies and they won't uh, affiliate themselves with anything that's not Christian. How can the light shine in darkness if that's the case? Later on in Matthew, Jesus is going to say this. Matthew 5, 14, this is the Sermon on the Mount. You are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And if that's true, why do so many Christians hide their light under the basket? Jesus, I mean, Jesus is the light of the world. He certainly didn't hide his light. He didn't isolate from the world. He ate with them, and he drank with them, something he was accused of by the Pharisees and the religious leaders. Jesus was among them, yet he didn't compromise. Now, this is how the tribes were set up in the land originally. And you can see in the yellow there, this was the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, two of the 12 tribes. And the reason it was now uh, such a Gentile territory is because from Isaiah's day on, um, when the Assyrians took the, the upper uh, portion of the Jews into captivity, they resettled the land with foreigners with Gentiles. And then uh, when Judea was taken into captivity into to Babylon, again, foreigners settled into the land so that by the time of Jesus, more than half of the population was Gentile. And the point of this is clear. 
in this despised Galilee region, the place where people were in darkness and the land of the shadow of death, a light was dawning. Jesus, the Messiah, was dawning. And, uh, and, and that light was first occurring in Gentile territory, showing that salvation is coming to all, not just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles as well. And this will be used against Jesus later on, as I said, but, uh, because the Jews were very prejudiced about this area. They hated this area. Uh, it was the area of the dogs. That's what they, how they referred to it. And so Jesus is the light. The people sat in darkness. And three, repent. Verse 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And in the Greek structure there, Jesus is emphatic. Jesus is emphatic. It was John the Baptist who had been preaching, but now the focus is shifting from John onto Jesus, which is where the focus should be anyway. Notice it doesn't say from that time forward, or from that time, Jesus began to heal the sick. Or from that time, Jesus began to perform miracles. Or from that time, Jesus began to walk on water. No, it says from that time, Jesus began to what? Preach. <laughs> he began to preach. And the word preach means to herald. And it was a word used for someone bringing a message from a king. And so Jesus was a preacher and a teacher first who also healed and performed miracles. But his priority, folks, Jesus' priority was to preach and teach the good news. Ryle writes this in his commentary. There's no office so honorable as that of the preacher. There is no work so important to the souls of men. It's an office which the Son of God was not ashamed to take up. It's an office to which he appointed his 12 apostles. It's an office to which St. Paul, in his old age, spe uh, specially directs Timothy's attention, and he charges him with almost his last breath to preach the word, 2 Timothy 4.2. It is the principal means which God has always been pleased to use for the conversion and edification of souls. The brightest days of the church have been those when preaching has been honored. The darkest days of the church have been those when it has been lightly esteemed. Let us honor the sacraments and public prayers in the church and reverently use them, but let us beware that we do not place them above preaching. Looking at the verse again. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so Jesus begins his ministry, his public ministry, the same way that John the Baptist uh, began his or left off, if you will. In fact, it's like Jesus is picking up where John left off. But Jesus, of course, would go further than John did because after all, he is the Messiah. And he's bringing salvation. Carson writes in his commentary, <clears throat> The separate context of the announcements made by John and by Jesus show that with Jesus, the kingdom has drawn so near that it has actually dawned. Therefore, Jesus' hearers must repent, a demand made not only by the Baptist but by Jesus. The structure of the book thus sets up an implicit parallelism. Jesus is not so much a new Moses as a new Joshua. For as Moses did not enter the promised land, but was succeeded by Joshua who did, so John the Baptist announces the kingdom and is followed by Jesus, or Joshua, that is his actual name, who leads his people into it. And so again, looking at the verse, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What that means is the kingdom of heaven is still future, but as we just read with Jesus, the kingdom of heaven has drawn so near that it has actually dawned. A light has dawned in Christ. God 
is right before their very eyes, physically. The Bible Knowledge Commentary. The twofold message of John was now proclaimed by the Messiah. The work of God was rapidly moving toward the establishing of the glorious kingdom of God on earth. If one wanted to be a part of the kingdom, he must repent. Repentance was mandatory if fellowship with God was to be enjoyed. And remember, we talked about repentance already. Repent means literally to change one's mind. That's what it literally means. And because the mind is changed, we change directions and we go toward God. So Capernaum became the headquarters of Jesus' two-year Galilean ministry. And we're going to spend a lot of time here. A light has dawned in Gentile territory. The Messiah had come, and he was preaching repentance and teaching the good news. And to whom much is given, much is required. He spent two years in this area, preaching to the towns in Galilee, all the different towns, you know. To whom much is given, much is required. Matthew 11, verse 20. Then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not, what? Repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. These are towns around the Sea of Galilee there. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Wow. Why? Because Jesus, the light had dawned. He was walking among them, and they missed it. Some of them did repent, of course. But the majority of them missed it, and they're accountable for that. And so today, the city of Capernaum is nothing but ruins. To much is given, much is required, folks. When we hear the message, when we come to church and we hear the word of God and we hear the good news and we hear the message of the gospel, guess what? We're accountable for it. It makes us accountable for it. Everything we receive comes with great responsibility. Over in Luke 12, verse 48, Jesus said, For everyone to whom much is given... From him, much will be required. And to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. The idea is that we're held responsible for what we receive. If we receive, if we're blessed with talents, for example, or we're blessed with wealth, or we're blessed with knowledge or truth or the gospel, it's expected that we use them to glorify God. And to benefit others. To whom much is given, much is required. And we today have been given much. We have the word of God. And God desires us to use that to further his kingdom. So some people would say, okay, so if we're accountable for what we hear, then it would be better if we didn't come to church. If we don't hear it, then we're not accountable for it. Well, no, that's not how it works. Sorry. First of all, you're forfeiting the blessings of coming to church and fellowshipping with believers. You're also forfeiting the practical applications that would benefit even an unbeliever that come out of the Bible. And third, the Bible says man is without excuse. There is no excuse. So you're better off coming and hearing and being accountable for it than not. Light has dawned. Jesus is the light. The people sat in darkness and have seen this great light. And the response to that should have been repentance. Some did. 
Some didn't. Many didn't. Just like the world that we're living in now, guys. The light has dawned. You are the light of the world. Let your light shine. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, again for your word. Lord, we acknowledge and confess the responsibility and sometimes the apathy that takes place in our lives as we just go through motions and just live life like there's just nothing else. But there is something else, Lord, and it's your kingdom. And I pray that each one of us here would, would light up and be the light of this world and that we would shine that light in the darkness, not try to hide the light under a bushel or a basket, but that we would let it shine. And Jesus, you ate with sinners and tax collectors. May we shine our light, not isolate from this world. Man, the time is short, how we need to shine. And I, I pray that for this church. I pray this church would be a light, a beacon in this community and in this world, and that we would shine brightly. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand.
bless you.